afternoon. My kids are obsessed with the show Mythbusters. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, it's a wonderful show in which uh, the hosts subject a series of empirical myths to actual physical testing. It's science in the most applied possible way. You take uh, an idea, you operationalize it, and you blow stuff up real good. My kids love the blow stuff up real good part. I want to do a little bit of, of myth examination, myth busting, although I'm not going to blow anything up. Uh, I'm looking at higher education in America and some of the myths by which we organize higher education. As with the Mythbusters, I'm not going to argue that we need to replace all myths with pure truth because I think myths serve a purpose. What I want to do is replace useless myths or outdated myths with more useful ones, something that might actually help us going forward. Historically, information was scarce. Information was valuable. And universities were storehouses of information. The Library of Alexandria was the first in many ways. The idea was that because books were scarce, books were expensive, and experts were rare, Universities were storehouses. They conserved the past. The whole idea of a literary canon is the idea that you preserve the best of what has been thought and said. And for a long time, that made sense. The lecture, lecture comes from the French lectrice, meaning to read. A lecture, historically, was the sage on the stage reading from the text to the students. Uh, the term recitation section, which still exists today, derives from the idea of reciting, you recite the text. When texts were rare, you had to actually read from the book for the students to get it. When movable type came along, that changed. But uh, you might remember a couple years ago when MOOCs were the big thing, massive open online courses. Kathy Davidson from Duke famously said, if MOOCs can replace what we do, they probably should. And that comment was widely misunderstood. And I think what she meant by it was, if all we do is information transmission, if all we do as educators is send information to students who didn't already have it, the internet will defeat us, because the internet can send more information, more quickly, more efficiently, than we ever could. And so, a lot of folks responded to MOOCs with the idea of the flipped classroom. Have students look at these videos online, have students get the information transmission outside of class, and reserve class time for the high value application piece, when students would actually apply what they learned. Those of us who used to teach in the pre-Google days, and I am one of them, We'll remember that we used to do something similar with books. The idea was that since movable type came along, the books were cheaper. <laughs> Students could read books outside of class, get the information transmission there, then come to class and apply what they had learned from the reading. As an experienced teacher, I can tell you two things wrong with this myth. The first thing wrong with the myth is that students don't always do the reading. I know it's shocking, but it's true. Uh, no matter how much you encourage them, no matter how many surprise quizzes you used, a lot of students would find ways not to do the reading. And so if they didn't do the reading, the flipped classroom did not work. The other thing wrong with it is even if they did do the reading, they often didn't understand it. This hit me when I was at DeVry teaching my first American government class. Uh, I had assigned a 20-page chapter on democratic pluralism. Don't ask. <laughs> and a student came up to me at the end of class with a sort of confused expression pointing to the paragraph, the first paragraph of the article, pointing to a word. He said, what's this word? He sounded it out. Partisan, what is that? I thought, whoa, you know, if you don't know the word partisan, this article made no sense to you. Even if they do the reading, if they can't figure it out, it doesn't help. Now, some would say that that plays into another myth, that some students are just not college material, that some are just not good at it. And in the days when information was scarce and expertise was scarce, there was actually some justification for restricting access to education. Why, as my dad used to say, never try to teach a pig to sing, to waste your time and annoy the pig. <laughs> There's some truth to that. If, if there are only so many seats to be had, if we can only afford to educate so many people, why waste education on people who can't use it? Now, of course, America being America, people who can't use it had different meanings. Uh, my mom, growing up in rural Michigan in the early 1960s, wanted to go to the University of Michigan. She had to convince her parents to send her, and this was at a time when women generally did not go to college. The argument she came up with, and she still laughs about this, she said, I want to marry a doctor. Where am I going to meet one? <laughs> uh, that worked. <laughs> she went to the University of Michigan. She, she got her master's life went on. <sighs> There's another myth that is kind of concurrent with the college material suggestion uh, that says this, prestige equals quality. The fewer the students who are allowed into the university, the better the university must be. The more exclusive it is, the better. 
It's a variation on the Groucho Marx's line, never join a club that would accept you as a member. <laughs> I know this myth is crap because I used to TA at, at Rutgers. When I, got my, when I was getting my PhD, I was a, a teaching assistant uh, in the poli-sci department at Rutgers, and I TA'd the intro to politics class, a 300 student lecture class, with a sage on stage doing pretty much what I'm doing right now, but not as well, as I said myself. <laughs> and there were four of us who were TAs, and our job was to run the recitation sections. There's that word again, recitation. 30 students per recitation section, more or less. Each of us had two or three sections, and our job was to be the interactive part because you couldn't really have an interactive part with 300 students in the auditorium. I had never taught a class in my life. I had no idea what to do. So the week before the, the class started, the professor took the four TAs out to lunch, which was unusual for Rutgers. And I remember asking him point blank, you know, next week classes start. On the first day of class, what do I do? And he kind of looked at me funny, and he said, and I remember this to this day, this is the sum total of my teacher training in graduate school, it will be fine. <laughs> Rutgers is the flagship state university of New Jersey. It is a research one institution. It is competitive to get into. It costs more than a community college or a state college to attend. These were high achieving students who had fought hard to get into a class that was being taught by a 23 year old whose entire training consisted of, you'll be fine. <laughs> Meanwhile, 10 miles up Route 1 at Middlesex a County College, students are being taught in classes of 25 by a full professor who was hired for teaching them. Prestige does not equal quality. They are two separate and distinct things. <sighs> Myths. Need a script. Thank you. Um, there are, Tolstoy once said there are two myths. Uh, every story comes down to one of two myths. Uh, a stranger comes to town and a hero goes on a quest. Every story can boil down to one of those two. I would argue that we embody both. Uh, every semester, strangers come to town on campus. Whole new sets of students come here that have never been here before. And our job is to empower them to become the heroes of their own stories. So to send them on their own quests. What does that look like? Uh, Bemi Enyon, who's a career counselor here, likes to tell the story. Um, a mother dragged her son to see, to see her. He was about to enroll. Dragged him by the nose ring in the way I picture. The student was unmotivated, let's say, um, skeptical of why he was even there. The mother asked the career counselor, what are the hot fields? What are the hot hiring fields? Because I want to steer him into the hot fields. And Benny said, no. Um, the question is, what does he care about? That'll be his hot field. On a good day, that's what we do. On our best days, that's what we do. I would argue that in the age in which information is free, we can no longer be the sage on the stage delivering information wholesale to students who are treated as if they were interchangeable. In my TA days, I recall a professor telling me that uh, research is the coin of the realm, but more importantly, teaching is sort of like laundry. It's something you have to do, but it's not the point. Every semester, you throw a new load into the machine and you call it good. I reject that. I rejected it then on moral grounds, I reject it now on practical grounds. At this point, with so many students, with so much information, and with so little expertise, doctors now are no longer, no longer hold a monopoly on medical expertise. Now, every time I watch a baseball game, it gets interrupted by ads in which I'm implored to ask my doctor if Viagra is right for me. <laughs> I hate those ads. Um, lawyers no longer have a monopoly on legal information. Now you get these commercials where you can do your will online. I have friends who went to law school who complain now that it's hard to find work because law firms are outsourcing their work to other countries. Professions built on monopolies of information are crumbling. If we don't want to crumble, if we don't want higher education to crumble the way that the legal profession is crumbling, the way that the medical profession is crumbling, we have to find a different reason to exist. I would suggest we take a look at what happened in the art world about 100 years ago. When representational art, pictures of things that looked like the things they were pictures of, gave way to abstract art. The object of the painting gave way to the subject of the painting. Instead of looking at what the painter was painting, we looked at what the painter saw. It became perception. I would say that we need to move away from valorizing the subject matter of what we teach as much, and valorizing more of the students we're teaching. Instead of just moving through the pipeline, help the students find their own way. That's a profoundly radical thing to do. 
think sometimes we forget how radical that actually is. Historically, that was not done. Um, Socrates argued famously uh, that most citizens can never handle the truth. Most people in the world are like prisoners chained to the wall of a cave. And behind them is a wall and a fire. And between the fire and that wall is a puppeteer. The puppeteer is holding up puppets, and the people on the cave wall are watching shadow puppets on the opposite wall. That's how they live their lives. All they see is shadow puppets. To the point that they think the shadow puppets are real. That's their entire world. Every so often, though, one of them, who's unusually strong or unusually gifted, manages to kind of break the chains. And he falls forward, and he stumbles, and he looks kind of ridiculous because they've never actually walked before, atrophied. And they start looking around and notice, oh, look, light's coming from up there. Let's go see what that is. And they climb out of the cave, and they see the light. They see the truth. They're enlightened in the most literal sense. Their eyes adjust. And they realize, oh, wait a minute, that was a cave. Those are shadow puppets. The whole thing was a lie. I have to go back and tell them. So the philosopher goes back down into the cave. And of course, when he goes back down into the cave, it takes a few minutes for his eyes to adjust. It's dark in there. So he's sort of stumbling around. He's getting in front of the shadow puppets. And he's saying to the citizens on the wall, the things you're seeing are not real. Crash. They think he's crazy. And they kill him. Most people can't handle the truth. And those who know the story of Socrates know that's exactly what happened to Socrates. The Athenians killed him. Aristotle argued there's no point in involving women or laborers or slaves in politics because they're too busy making things to think higher thoughts. It can't be done. They have to be excluded. In the Bible, the fall was occasioned by eating from the tree of knowledge. Unauthorized knowledge was sin. In America, until the early 20th century, in many states, it was illegal to teach African Americans to read. You could go to jail for that. Knowledge was sin. What we do on our best days, and I'm not going to pretend that every day is our best day, what we do on our best days is we empower everybody to find their own way. That's profoundly radical. Hegel tells the story of the phenomenology of spirit. He calls it the master-slave dialectic. Um, this is the image I like to end on. Picture Crusoe and Friday trapped on a desert island. They're stuck there for a long time. They know it. They immediately start fighting for power. Each one wants the other one to do all the work. So Crusoe gets Friday in the chokehold. He's threatening to kill him. He says, you climb the coconut tree. You get the coconuts. You do the work or I'll kill you. Friday, fearing for his life, says, OK. So Crusoe is the master. Friday is the slave. This works for a while, but of course, as Friday is climbing the tree and doing all the work, Friday's getting buff, he's getting ripped, and Crusoe is getting fat and lazy. Friday notices this. So eventually, Friday revolts. Friday gets Crusoe in the chokehold, says, I've got you now. If you don't do the work, I'll kill you. Crusoe, fearing for his life, says, OK. This goes back and forth six or seven or eight times. The breakthrough moment, though, comes when Crusoe has Friday in the chokehold, threatening to kill him. And the light bulb goes on over Friday's head. And Friday says, no, you're bluffing. You can't kill me. You need me. Because if you kill me, you have to climb the tree yourself. That's when the game changes. On our very best days, and I'm not going to pretend they're all the best, but on our very best days, we empower students with that moment. We help them break the chokehold. They are choked by life. They are choked by circumstance. Aristotle was not completely wrong. People, and I mean everybody, is trapped by life circumstances. Sometimes they can break through. They can see the next thing. That's what we do on our very best days. That's what we need to do when information is free. We can't out-inform the internet. It will never happen. But we can out-empower it.